From late fall through early spring, I can, on any clear night, step out of my back door and see Orion rising from the south. Why Ptolemy, who cataloged most of the constellations we know, chose to name this particular one after a hunter who, even in Greek mythology, just ain't that prominent, and not after Hercules or Perseus or a half dozen better known sword wielding guys, is beyond me. Yes, they have their own constellations, but they're not nearly as noticeable. Maybe Ptolemy got halfway through his list when he said, Oops, I forgot that big collection of stars in the south. Well, all the good names are taken, so I'll just name it after, uh, Orion. And then there's the fact that the constellations are now all defined and standardized by the International Astronomical Union. Remember, these are the same people who demoted Pluto. So I think somebody better step in and take the constellations away from them before they decide to rename Cygnus after Gene Shalit. I have a special affection for the constellation Orion because it's the second constellation I learned to recognize. The first was the Big Dipper, also known as Ursa Major, or the Great Bear, although the fact that it has such an incredibly long tail makes me think Ptolemy hadn't seen that many bears. We're probably lucky that Ptolemy was completely unfamiliar with the fauna of North America because he might have been tempted to call the Big Dipper Mephitis Major, and, let's face it, the Great Skunk doesn't have the same ring to it. I'll never forget the first time I heard about the Big Dipper. It was in the middle of summer, no sign of clouds, and one of the kids across the street said, Tonight will be a good night to see the Big Dipper. I didn't want to appear ignorant, even though he wasn't talking to me, so I just nodded knowingly and went back to collecting roly-polies. Later I asked my mother what the Big Dipper was. I think I was five or six at the time and had no clue what even a dipper was. My mother told me that that night she'd pointed out to me. I think I imagined something like the moon, something big and easy to spot, which made me wonder why I'd never noticed it before. That night we went outside and she bent down next to me and started pointing at the stars, saying, There's the spoon and there's its handle. Do you see it? I didn't want to appear ignorant, so I said, Yeah, uh, okay. While I was thinking, what the heck is she talking about? All I see is a bunch of stars. If I hadn't heard about the Big Dipper from somebody else, I probably would have thought my mother was out of her mind. In all fairness, I'm pretty sure my mother, a former teacher, started by explaining that the Big Dipper is a constellation and that those are designs made by collections of stars. But I probably missed that, being more concerned about the fact that the denizens of my roly-poly zoo were escaping by simply walking through the moat I'd carefully built around it. It wasn't really until I'd seen Connect the Dots pictures of the Big Dipper and a show about constellations at the planetarium that I figured out what it was. And I got a huge thrill, almost like learning a magic trick, out of being able to actually spot it for myself in the night sky. In spite of the thrill, I avoided learning other constellations, just because I thought they were too hard to piece together. Orion, though, is kind of hard to miss, even in a fairly light-polluted neighborhood. I think I recognized Orion even before I knew which constellation it was, and once I looked it up, that pretty much opened the floodgates. Now I can spot Cassiopeia, Andromeda, Draco maybe his father Lucius, or even on a good night, Gene Shallot. What never ceases to amaze me, though, is that I'm never actually seeing the stars as they were, but as they once were. Even when I look at the sun, which I know you're never supposed to do, but as a kid I would do anyway, if only for just a second, I know it's the sun as it was eight minutes ago. With stars, and this is the part that always gets me, it's as they were hundreds, thousands, even millions of years ago. When we look at stars, we are literally looking at a ray of light projected to us from distant space. I know this is Astronomy 101, but it still gets me that when I look at the sky, I'm seeing stars that could have burned out when my ancestors didn't even know how to make fire. A little more Astronomy 101. Astronomers always talk about light years, and everyone knows that it's, that's a measure of distance based on how long it takes light to travel one year. A light year is about 6 trillion miles. To really put that in perspective, if you could bend a beam of light around the Earth at the equator, it would, if I've done my math correctly, and please check me on this, circle the planet seven times in a single second. In a year, that same beam of light would circle the Earth more than 220,752,000 times. That's a single light year. The nearest star to Earth, Proxima Centauri, is a little more than four light years away from us. Betelgeuse, one of the stars in Orion, is 640 light years away from us, but it's also so big that it outshines most other stars in the sky. 
But again, we're not seeing it as it is now. If it were to disappear today, it would still burn in our sky for 640 years. At one point in Alice in Wonderland, Alice, fearing she's going to shrink out of existence, tries to imagine what a flame looks like after it's gone out. She didn't realize that she'd seen just that in stars. Stars are candles that burn so brightly their light is stretched across time. The only thing to me more amazing than that is that when stars burn out, some of them will, in dying, build the elements that life itself is built from. Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and every other element is nothing more than a cluster of hydrogen atoms smashed together in the heart of a dying star. Supernovae build the very elements life is made from. If you've ever seen footage of the first hydrogen bomb test on Bikini Atoll, you know how incredibly powerful hydrogen fusion is. Our sun and every other star is powered by the same fusion reaction, turning hydrogen into helium. When a large enough star begins to die, it fuses the hydrogen and helium, producing lithium, which fuses, producing more elements. Think back to that H-bomb explosion and imagine how much bigger it would have been if instead of hydrogen, they'd used lithium, which has three times the mass of hydrogen. And the process doesn't slow down until the star starts making iron, which takes more energy to fuse than the reaction produces. But it still goes on, producing element after element. Finally, the star explodes, spreading its freshly minted elements across light years, where they'll eventually form planets and possibly even life. Walt Whitman has a famous poem about astronomy. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures, were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and the diagrams, to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer, where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became, tired and sick, till, rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself, in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. You know, I don't think that poem is really about the science of astronomy itself. Whitman, after all, is responsible for the phrase, I sing the body electric. So I think he understood how much poetry there is in science. I wonder what Whitman would have thought if he'd heard and fully understood what Carl Sagan said more than a century later. The earth and every living thing are made of star stuff. Astronomy is the essence of poetry and everything else.